And how did the group actually come about? Um, I don't know, Steve and Paul, they, I think they just used to the nickel load of stuff for right? yeah. equipment. Just because it, it was a laugh to do, I suppose I was interested in music anyway, so they used to nick equipment. Yeah. And it seemed as though they had all this equipment around, they didn't know what to do with it, so they might as well learn to play it. So that's how they started. Yeah. Um, then they started to get a little bit more serious. And they had this bass player who was married and a wife and kid and you know, never turned up for rehearsals and all that. And it was about that time I met them, so I was learning to play bass then. So, you know, just... Just went on from there, yeah. yeah. Why did you leave the group? Um, well, I worked for Malcolm, right, since I was 16. And yeah. I was still working for him, there wasn't any more. And that I couldn't get on with John at all. Um, Steve and Paul, you know, just a couple of blokes that are doing it, they just like to come and labour a bit, really. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's just time for a change. I felt it had all been set up mm. and the idea was complete. There was no more to do with it. It's, it's just like going out and doing it, but that wasn't where the interest, like for me, the interest was like setting it up and making it kind of complete, you know. More interested in ideas and just like selling them, because that's I think that's what it is now. It's just it's just selling. It's a purely commercial kind of thing. What ideas did you feel were incorporated in in the group to start with? I mean, what excited you about that to start with? Well, just uh, um, I wanted to be in a group because I never heard a band that I liked totally that I thought was exactly right. You know what a rock and roll band should be. Yeah. Like. So I wanted to do it for myself to, you know, so like I can hear my own records on the radio and kind of think, yeah, that's kind of good, you know. Mm. Um, not because it's me, but it's because of always, what I've always wanted to hear. And the same, like, kind of image-wise, I wanted as well, yeah. What particular ideas, though, do you think are in, incorporated in that? Well, I don't know, just everything was so laid back at that time, anything that was slightly excited. It was a very contrived, kind of very poserish mm. way of going about things. Very arty. You know, it's, it's like somebody sat down and thought out an idea and mm. thought, oh, I'm going to be like that, you know. Well, it was all David Bowie and Roxy Music. It was mm. very contrived things. And it was just good to just go out and like rock out, you know. Yeah. Be a rock and roll, because there was no rock and roll band at all. And when you, when you say that you've got bored with the ideas, um, in what, I mean, why did you feel that it was getting boring? Well, because, I don't know, it was like um, out of our hands a bit. Um, Malcolm had taken even more control. Um, the, the press had taken it to such an extent where it couldn't be really controlled anymore. It's like the idea was set up, and no matter what you said, it still didn't affect it. I mean, after all that, um, Bill Grundy, shall I say, no matter what you said to the paper the next day, it still come out that he was just like a swearing mm. lout with belched and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it didn't matter whether you said something interesting to him or not, it just wouldn't come out, because they had that sad idea of you. Um, yeah, there wasn't much you could do to change it. But I mean, that didn't matter though, because that was partly the idea anyway, that mm. it was kind of wild. But the idea is there now, so what bother to do with that anymore? Do something different. Mm. How? What was your kind of um, relationship with Malcolm when when you were in the group, or or even from before? Can you say what? But it was always like? just seemed like I was working for him. Mm. If you come up with an idea about something, like you go, mm, no, so I wasn't really interested. And two weeks later, you find he'd have it in his shop. Right, and he's sort of like, I don't know, he just felt kind of like ch cheated a little bit because he would never even admit to it. It might even be slightly your idea, you know. He takes things like that, but he never gives anything, you know, any sort of like credibility back, any kind of credence to the fact that it's your idea. And when you're working with somebody, you need that right, to feel as though there's some kind of partnership. Yeah. That's what's interesting, we're working with somebody. But it, it was always just a one-way thing. Although he'd do things for, for you, like kind of running things, it was still ultimately for his own benefit. Mm. 
you know, he needed you to toe the line in certain respects. Um, you know, so his thing could work proper. Mm. But he wouldn't like bother about, you know, but his thing turn the line for your benefit so your, like, your thing could work proper. And in fact, that's why I split really in the end. Yeah. Because it was so much of a one way thing. Mm. It was just, yeah. He just doesn't seem to have any respect for the people he works with. How did you get on with um, with Vivian? Not much. Mm. Why not? No, she was. I almost thought she's a bit dopey. Mm. Just a bit kind of scatty. She's got. Just seems like a bit, a bit of a dopey northerner to me. Mm. The way that, not dopey in the sense stupid, but you know how it is when you get somebody out of a different kind of um, background, you know, mm. colloquial. Is that the. Yeah. You know, she talks in a funny kind of way. Mm. And she's got a funny sense of humour. If you, you, sort of, you could tell a joke to somebody, right? Mm. And like they'd laugh or they wouldn't laugh, depending on how the joke was. But you used to tell a joke to Vivian. And she would always be saying, I don't understand, you know, what that word means or what that line means. And like, you'd take half an hour to tell this joke, right? Mm. And like, it'd be a real ordeal just to, to speak to her over that kind of thing. So, you know, I just didn't, didn't really have much to do with it. No, not really. It's a really funny situation with the pistols because nothing was ever spoken about. It was never like everybody decided we was going to do such and such and it was an idea that everybody worked towards mm. it was just a very natural thing like it, there was four guys in the band you know they just felt a certain way but they never spoke about it it was just like an understood thing you know mm. and it all happened but after like two years you see how you differ mm. and then maybe then you start talking about it how you should like put it together again but if it's beginning to go apart then it's going apart and you might as well Go your own way and do something different. You said you didn't get on with John. Can you remember any particular incidents or anything? It was just like a continuous kind of. But I mean, I can't stand the way he talked to people. It's just he's like say, oh, I dropped dead. And he don't really mean it, but he's, everything he says is like, oh, I dropped dead, and it just like niggles you. And when you're rehearsing with a guy, and all you can say is, oh, I dropped dead, and not bother to sing properly, you know, like. His, his whole thing when we were rehearsing was like he was on he was on stage, right? He could be with his mates, the guys from outside the band, completely natural. And he could be with us sometimes when he was pissed. He was alright, you could get on with him. But all the rest of the time it was like a big act. Mm. That it was like on a point system and he had to score more points. It was he was always in a, a fight against us to be like kind of top notch. And I can't stand competitions like that. I think that's all mm. nonsense, it's just a waste of time. So I didn't want to know about that. But he would do it continually and it just really niggled me. Why do you think he did it? I don't know. I think he's kind of really kind of insecure in some ways. He's just, he feels he has a lot to prove. I don't know why. Um, you know, people say it's because of his background and he's really hard done by and all mm. that. Maybe he was materially, but you know, with his parents and all that, he's like, he's kind of, his, his mum's, you know, he's his mum's golden boy, really, and mm. she, she's like all feather dusters around him, and, you know, isn't he lovely and all that. Mm. So he's really been a bit kind of mollycoddled. He's very, very childish, kind of, like, he's very, I don't know, sort of, yeah, he's just a bit childish. Oh, and another thing about John is, we did this gig with Screaming Lord Such, and we was using the PA in their equipment with their microphones. And John broke about three microphones, like smashed them. And after we'd been off, right, the guy from Screaming Lord Such band came and said, you broke our microphones. John said, I didn't. And he swore blind that he hadn't broken them, but I'd seen him like a minute before, like, going like that. Mm really like pummeling him into the ground. And he completely denied it and he believed that he hadn't as well. I couldn't, I thought, what? Mm. I just couldn't understand it. 
Did that sort of thing happen quite a lot? Yeah, that was, that was like when I say I can, you know, kind of like take the way he talks and his kind of, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, it's his kind of character, his way of speaking, his way of telling stories mm. and all that kind of stuff. I don't know, he'd always do things like that. He's like a terrible liar in a way. Mm. And, you know, over very trivial kind of things like that. But he'd always be doing it. He'd say something. And like five minutes later, he completely denied that he'd said it. And he believed, believed that he'd, you know, believe it. He wouldn't just be saying it just to like, well, he might be just saying it to win points, but he would believe that he hadn't said it. And he had, you know, everybody had heard him. No matter what you said to him, he, was, he still couldn't change his mind. It was really weird. I don't know, one of the things I always remember was when I was playing at the Andrew Club. This is another kind of example of friction between me and John. It was at the Andrew Club. It was the first time I played at the Andrew Club. There was only about 50 people there, I thought. And um, me, Steve, and Paul, and Malcolm, like, fucked up. But like, we'd all decided that it was kind of good not to be around the gig, so when you go on stage, it's a little bit more special than like you're just getting out of the audience. You know what I mean? So like, we was trying to get John to come with us, and John was with his mates that night, and it was all like, you know, I'm not in charge of the group, and I do exactly what I want to do. So he stayed in the underclub, and he got well pissed with his mates. Right, by the time he got on stage, he was like, falling arse over to it, and couldn't sing the words of the songs properly, and kept coming in at the wrong time. And his mate us look cunts as well. Mm. Because like we was playing all right, but because he was like coming in at the wrong time, we would it seemed like we was coming in at the wrong time at all. And I don't know, he was just kept glaring at me like that all the time. He smashed up glasses on the floor. And there's one of the songs. It's like go, like I love you. Like that's the chorus that was a backup, right? But he came in completely wrong. I was just pissed off. I said, "Well, oh, I can't." I was like singing that instead. Right, he's good. <laughs> In, in the middle of the song, he says, do you want to fight? Like, in my hand. I said, nah, I don't think so, not really. You know, not now. I'd rather play the bass, thank you very much. And like, he said, I'll fight you, you can't. And like, all these mates are sort of going, you know, going, John. And I don't know, he just freaked after that and he ran off stage and ran out of the club. And, you know, he's like standing on stage thinking, oh, well, that's, like, that's the end of the gig then, more like the end of the band. And, then Malcolm shouted at me, get back on that stage and that's the end of you. <laughs> right. Then John come back down, you know, and he wanted to do an encore, we didn't want to know. He sort of like, he'd been sitting at the top of the stairs and he come back down, really sheepish. Mm. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to know, we didn't see him for a couple of days after that. Can you tell me a bit about what the music means to you and how you go about composing and that kind of thing? I don't know, it's just, you get an idea in the back of your head, like, you're feeling, you're sitting like down, and you're feeling in a certain kind of way. Mm. You know, you're in a particular kind of mood. And you get an idea, right, and it's kind of, the, the sounds fit that mood a bit. You know, like when you listen to like a classical record, right, and it's like going, <laughs> It's all worked out, or it's like, dee, 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 dee. no, really nice. Just, just that same kind of way. I just try and write something that embodies the mood that I'm, I'm feeling. Mm. And also, then John would come together with the with the words. Yeah. Right, and it would take you know, some when the words come together good, the idea of the music would fit the idea of the words, like anarchy, right? Mm. I'd sort of had an idea for a real kind of. Um, I don't know, it's like a marching kind of tune, like an anthem kind of thing, you know, you can like march down the streets to it really. Mm. And the words just fitted it exactly. 